Welcome to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Every week, I'll be sitting down with a sales executive where they'll share their stories and experiences that produce game-changing results. Let's be honest, sales can be a tough game. I'm sure at some point, we've all delivered a less than stellar demo, been ghosted by a client or two, and sometimes, maybe we did more talking than listening. And that's where I can help. The stories and insights our guests share can be applied to your own business, your territory, or with your team, so you're not reinventing the wheel. Our weekly tactics and strategies help you get out of your head and start creating your own path towards game-changing results. I am delighted to have Jason Bay back to the podcast. Uh, it's been over two years and so much has changed. So Jason, welcome back to the podcast. Yeah, it's good to be back. Like I was saying before this, like you're, you're pretty good at the whole podcast thing. So uh, I'm excited for the conversation today. We're, we're dancing. We're dancing in the moment here and kind of free, freewheeling it, which is good as well. Um, yep. Well, I, I think, you know, it's safe to say we're both passionate about the discovery phase. Uh, a lot of what you talk about, yep. and I, I do follow your posts, your podcast. Uh, and if those of you who haven't uh, tuned in, definitely recommend Outbound Squad. But um, I personally feel that you make it or break in, dis in, in discovery. And so really what I wanted to do today is kind of get tactical so people, regardless yeah. if they're in person or um, virtual, can really understand the goal and, um, and walk away with something that they can apply immediately. So why don't you first start, you know, high level of what do you see? The, the big challenges in the discovery, like, is there a trend or theme that people are kind of missing the mark when it comes to discovery? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you put yourself in the seat of a rep or sales leader and you think about the sales process, it's typically taught in a very linear way, right? Like if you're, if you're a rep right now, like look at your CRM stages in Salesforce or HubSpot, and it's probably very linear. It's like stage one might be discovery, Stage two might be qualification. Stage three might be demo, like proposal, et cetera. And we kind of treat the sales process as a series of steps in meetings. And from a leadership standpoint, it's probably the easiest way to kind of like teach it at first is to think of it in a very linear way so that like a rep can wrap their head around the process. The problem when you treat sales like a series of, of meetings and steps is you don't think about the milestones that you need to accomplish. So I like to think about like, what does this deal need in order to gain momentum? One of those big things is from a stakeholder standpoint, do I have a good champion? This is something I don't think gets talked about enough. People talk all about multi-threading and objection handling and negotiations, but you can't really do any of that very effectively without a really strong champion or two. But from a stakeholder standpoint, do the right people, are they involved in this deal? That's not reflected in like the meetings that someone might do necessarily or the boxes they're checking through the sales pipeline. Do I have a strong champion? Um, am I aligned with a business priority? Is there an open project right now for whatever it is that I sell? So to kind of like put a bow on that, the, the biggest challenge that I see with reps that I work with especially is they know they need to go through these steps and have these meetings that have these labels, but there isn't really an understanding of what I need to accomplish. It's kind of like if you were trying to build muscle or lose weight and you know that you need to go to the gym and you know that you need to eat a certain way, but you don't really understand like the mechanics of what's actually happening. Like you don't understand the mechanics of like, yeah, when I go to the gym, it can't just be working out like putting on muscle helps, you know, kind of burn fat. Um, cardio helps burn calories, but there isn't really, you know, a, a thermal effect in your body after like not understanding some of those things of like, hey, what are we actually trying to accomplish? Makes it really hard to, in that case, lose weight or gain muscle or whatever your goal is. So just understanding like the parts and the milestones really that you need to accomplish to either quickly disqualify a deal or win a deal. That's the biggest mistake in how I see sales teams run just their sales process in general. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say definitely it is linear, but that's for those assuming they have a sales process because I, I find a lot of people don't in fact have a process they're following in the first, in the first place. Yeah, no kidding, huh? <laughs> it's like, you know, you're, you're supposed to like 
like this makes it really hard to ask for next steps when you don't know what you're supposed to accomplish. Like, especially with enterprise sales, the number one thing that any executive wants to know is not necessarily what the agenda of a call is, but what is the outcome? What are we trying to accomplish? And demo is not an outcome. So when you don't really understand kind of these pieces around what builds momentum early in a deal, it makes it really hard to have a good productive discovery conversation with someone because you don't know what you're trying to figure out. And, and just back to what you said, you know, not really understanding what they're trying to accomplish or even the why, like back to the, the muscle building. Like if you just tell me to do this, mm -hmm. I can do it. But for me, I had a personal trainer, but I always wanted to educate myself to know why and muscle build and, and why this exercise. So I didn't always need to have a personal trainer. I, I could be that person yeah. myself. And I think it's difficult or almost impossible to do that when you don't have an awareness of and whether, you know, even as its starting point, if it is linear, but just mm -hmm. what I have to do first and, and why, and when I do this, where is it leading to? Because if we don't know that, how are we going to in turn guide our, our prospects through a journey when we're kind of in that fragmented, okay, I'm step one, let me just look around, we're step two. And you're just, it's kind of like the blind leading the blind. Yep, exactly. So you mentioned champion. For those perhaps who are new, you know, new to sales or um, may not have ever had a champion, mm -hmm. can you kind of give us an idea of, of your version of what a champion is? Yeah. If I could go a little more high level than that real quick, just to give some context into that, I really like uh, I, I like medics kind of version and their explanations for the different types of stakeholders. So we'll kind of borrow from that for a second. I think the high level objective that we have is with discovery and running a sales process, our goal is to either build momentum really quickly and get this deal off to a good start or it's to disqualify early. One of the strategies that we should employ to do that is reverse engineering success. So even if you're a brand new rep with zero experience in sales or at that company, unless you're at a brand new startup, there is a way that deals come together. One of the first things that you can do is with your sales leader or with your own uh, deals that you've closed or closed lost is pull a report in Salesforce and look at the commonality in those deals and the people that are like the key players. Um, I just did this analysis. I think it was on 42 closed one deals. And what I was looking for is, you know, who, who are my champions in those deals? Who are the economic buyers? And I'll talk about what those are in a second. And then who is my first point of contact typically with? So again, to borrow from medic here, there is essentially your economic buyer. If we kind of start at the top and that could be more than one person, this is typically the person that like the buck stops with them. They can veto everything. And they're typically the person that not necessarily signs the contract, but it's their budget. So if we're looking at the case of HR solutions, that's your CHRO, right? That's the person where they're going to work directly with that CFO around budget related things. They are your economic buyer, them and the CFO probably. Where there starts to get some confusion with champions is people oftentimes mistake champions and in the medic world, what they call coaches. So I'll give you an example. A coach is someone that has information and impact. So Nate Nasrallah, he's a founder of a company called Fluent. This is his kind of three eyes that I really, really like. It's a true champion has these three eyes. It's impact, um, impact, information, and influence. So they have information to share with you, right? They know like the inner workings of the company. Um, they impact, they have, they will personally be impacted by the solution. So they care a lot about personally. Now where they tend to lack a coach versus a champion is in the influence part. So oftentimes, if I give you a really practical example, this probably happens to you, Karen, too, is an inbound lead comes in. And maybe it's a really big company that we that we would love to work with, and it's a sales enablement manager. Now, I don't care how awesome that sales enablement manager is, and it's nothing against people enablement. No matter how awesome they are and how much information they have, they're probably, in my experience, not going to be the actual champion in that deal because they're not meeting with the VP of sales on a weekly basis. The VP of sales is more likely my champion. So I think the difference between those is really important. Oftentimes people mistake coach and champion. They think they have a champion because they have information and they will personally, imp like the personal impact to them is positive. They see the win. 
but they don't have influence. So those are kind of the three big ones. And then you have like your influencers and like end users and people that are going to be using the product or service. You have, you know, um, blockers, that sort of stuff. But that was kind of a roundabout way of answering your question. I think reverse engineering success and looking at how does a great deal come together? For me, that first point of contact is usually someone at the manager or director level that comes inbound. And I know that I'm going to have to multi-thread through the sales process to get in contact with an actual champion and then to eventually make contact with the economic buyer. Mm -hmm. A lot of, lot of lingo there brought me back to my Miller Hyman days <laughs> back pre pre 2000, mm -hmm. but uh, all, and all still very valid. And I think it goes back to just yep. understanding like the buyer's journey and understanding not only the steps that you have to take, but the steps that they have to take and the roles. And um, I think yep. when, like for me, I do the same thing and I definitely roll reverse. If I looked back, I could see the trends. I can see, you know, when, when certain titles reach out to me where it closes, if it takes longer, but I think the more information and data points we collect, we can be more predictable. And, and I always say like, take, take exactly. that incoming, that inbound and look at the emails they're sending, look at the language they're using because they're, t they're, they're basically, their hands are open showing you everything. And then how can you flip that to outbound and basically you're, you're leveraging the voice of the customer that they've told you. But I, I feel that too many people are still coming at it from the, the, the seller standpoint. And like you said, it's linear, it's seller language. They don't, they don't call it a demo. They don't call it discovery. Like they don't call it that. And so when we can really be aware yeah. of the buyer and their role and how they make a decision and what's like, why would they, even if they have influence, why would they leverage it for you? You know, and just really kind of come at it from that other person's perspective so that you are in a position to reverse engineer it. And we could go have a debate back and forth on how the sales stages should be named. I'm personally not a fan of either, you know, labeling them in terms of the buyer's journey or sales, you know, process. It's really about what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to accomplish should be buyer centric. Um, so that would be the first kind of strategy is reverse engineering success and knowing how a good deal comes together for your solution. And that's going to really set you up for this second strategy I call power in numbers, and that's champion building. So how do you build a good champion? I think there's some like obvious things that people aren't thinking about. Like this is literally in the, f in the first and second calls of meeting a new prospect, I want to identify who might be those champions. And again, I go back to those three eyes, influence, impact, and information. And a common situation that people run into, I run into this all the time, is the first call is with a group of buyers. So three people come inbound. Let's say it's a head of enablement and two of their enablement managers, the people that are most focused on outbound, let's say, because that's where I spend a lot of my time with organizations. And then a mistake that you can make in this situation is that every single call that you do moving forward is with the entire group. And you never thread, like multi-threading, a part of that is like, what is the relationship with the individuals? So I think champion building, first thing you want to think about is you need an individual or, or a couple of individuals that will really champion the deal. You have to take that communication and relationship one to one. One very simple thing that you can do in a group meeting, if you get that vibe that, hey, I know this head of enablement is going to be my champion. Let's say his name's David for whatever reason. Um, at the end of that call, I might do something like, hey, David, by the way, between now and our next group call, can we get some one-on-one -on -one time and really help me prepare the presentation for the team on the next call? You mind if I shoot you a quick text? What's your phone number? Or you mind if we get that time set up right now? I want to build that one-to-one -one relationship because then the information piece of champion building, I can get a lot more intel in a one-to-one -one setting versus a group. So that's a common mistake that I see people make. They only run group meetings and they never take the conversation one to one. Mm -hmm. And when you're asking David one to one, are you doing that in front of the the other two uh, enablers? Yeah, definitely. Okay. And why why do you think, in your experience, Jason, why are people still playing zone and not man on man? <laughs> I love that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great analogy. Um, well, it's extra work. I think is the is the big thing. But two. It's really easy to get happy years when a group comes in inbound and everyone seems really excited. But what you're not going to get from that group is you're not going to get like 
really good details on how a buying decision gets made at that company with an entire group there. You're not going to get stuff like, hey, you know, I know so and so's our VP of sales, but really most of the stuff's going to roll up to the chief sales officer unless we get her on board, which I suggest that we do in this way. Like this whole thing's going to fall apart. You're never going to get details like that in a group meeting. Mm hmm. And, and back to what you said about momentum, I mean, that's going to obviously stall that momentum. So what, what I'm hearing is when you can kind of segment it off, get it, get granular with that one on one, test yeah. them out to find out if they are, in fact, you know, uh, have the criteria to be a champion. You get those insight because I think a lot of times, too, what I see is there's conformity. People are perhaps afraid to really, you know, share what's actually on their mind. And so many times when I've broken it apart, I get information that I, I never I would never ask. Yeah. But they, they felt I guess, safe that it is one on one to share it with me. Yeah. I mean, think about in your everyday personal life when you go hang out with groups of people. What's the conversation like when you go one to one and you're at the bar grabbing a drink or getting lunch or whatever versus four of your friends are at the table? Now you have conversations going on separately with people. So you think about the group dynamic on a Zoom call. Once you have more than two people and they're like three or four people, the dynamic changes, the dynamics very different when there's like eight or nine or more people where now all of a sudden everyone's on mute. I hate that, by the way, in meetings where everyone's got themselves on mute. No one's really talking and chiming in. So you got to be kind of be uh, aware of that dynamic. So the strategy of power and numbers, like the champion building guide, like this is they're going to help you map out the stakeholders. So when we reverse engineer success and and we look at, we know that these players generally need to be involved in the deal. Your champion's going to help you like validate who you think should be involved. Like that's just a great conversation to have with them. I think the other thing too that you need to take advantage of is the best way to build that relationship is not only going one-to-one, -one, but it's going outside of structured meetings. So asynchronous communication, you should absolutely, and do it with permission. I don't always ask for permission to do it. <laughs> Depends on the rapport I have with the person, but you should be texting. You should absolutely have a relationship. Like to me, it's not a champion if you don't text. So there's just all kinds of one-off stuff that you can ask them. If we do a group meeting, I'll text them afterwards. How do you think that that went? How do you think so-and-so is feeling about this? Um, where are we stuck? There's just all of this like asynchronous communication that can happen between. And then don't forget the power of just picking up the phone and having the random call. The relationship, you build it in so much more of a deeper way when you have this type of communication with them outside of a structured meeting and outside of email. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. When you think about texting, I mean, it's 100% open rate, but the the frequency, the more, you know, the more touch points and the more often, because it's so immediate that there's this feeling that, oh, it's Jason, like, like we were buddies already because yep. it's, that's how you, I mean, for me, I equate texting with my friends, but when I can do it in business with relations, you could just feel it, that it expedites a lot quicker. Yeah. You just get way more like real information from people. So so key strategy one is reverse engineering success. Strategy number two is just knowing there's power in numbers. One thing that we kind of skipped over was this third strategy of building reciprocity. That you want to do this really early. Like with discovery, our goal is to extract information. That doesn't necessarily align with the buyer's goal, <laughs> right? We're trying to extract information. And if you're listening to this and you've ever been in a position where you feel like, oh, I kind of feel like I'm playing 21 questions right now and I'm doing all the stuff I was told to do, right? I'm talking less than the prospect. I'm asking lots of questions. You're going to find that you wear out a person, a person's patience really quickly when you're just hammering them with questions, regardless of how good the questions are. So building reciprocity is how do we set up reciprocity where we're showing them that we're putting in effort, therefore they're willing to put in effort. And the effort that we want them to put in is like giving us really good intel on what they're trying to accomplish. Because that's really what I want to know is, does what you're trying to accomplish and what problems you have aligned with what our solution can help with? I want to find that as quickly as possible. The number one way to build reciprocity is showing up prepared. So we already talked about reverse engineering success. I can't tell you, Karen, how many reps I see show up to sales calls and they'll admit it's over half of the reps typically in trainings that I do. They don't even do the basics of getting on LinkedIn and like looking at who they like basic account mapping, who they think might be in the buying group. So if I'm hopping on with a head of enablement before that call, I'm looking at 
the VP of sales, I should be able to refer to us for on a first name basis in that first call, their CRO. Uh, if they have a VP of sales enablement, I should know all of those people. I should be able to ask for them by name in the call. And what this shows is that you just did your homework. So stakeholders is a really big part of it. And then you also need to know what's going on with the company and then with the individual that you're speaking with. So those are the three kind of parts. It's company, individual, and stakeholders. From a company standpoint, just looking at based on the publicly available data that you have access to, what are some of the obvious triggers that would indicate a need for your solution? So I use another example. I work at a company that sells into contact center leaders. And essentially, their solution helps you gather a lot of intelligence and data to reduce the cost to serve. So these contact centers, ironically, like all of these big companies, the ironic thing about contact centers is they actually don't want people to call them because <laughs> it costs money when people to call them. So they want you to <laughs> they want you to self-serve and answer your own questions. So a, an obvious thing that I'm going to look for on the company is how are they attempting to do that right now? Like on the support page, is there like really good FAQ? Is there like a chat function in there? Like what are the obvious things that it looks like they are trying to do to solve the problem? Um, if I sell an HR solution and our big value prop is we take all of the solutions you would do for payroll benefits, et cetera, and we combine that into one, like another one of my clients, I should look and see what solutions they're using that are publicly available on their site. When I go to apply for a job, does Greenhouse pop up? You know? Um, is it obvious that they're doing other stuff? Are they hiring? There's, there's obvious triggers there. What you're trying to do is put together a story of what you think might be happening so that I can come in and say, Hey, Karen, before we get started, I did a little bit of research. Do you mind if I share what I found? Yeah. You look a lot like this other company, ABC, who we noticed was using a lot of the different solutions. It looks like you guys are using, you know, greenhouse for your applications, XYZ solution for this XYZ for that. If you're like a lot of our customers in this situation, what you might be experiencing is a lot of just manual cumbersome work that's like bogging your team down and it's keeping you from hitting the hiring targets that you have in order to like really scale the company. How, how did I do? What did I miss? Like you want to be able to come in with a perspective and a hypothesis on what's going on. And the goal there is not to have them say, oh my God, are you reading my mind? It's like, there might be a little bit of that, but it's really, I'm showing that I put in a lot of effort to understand your situation. And my thing with sales and discovery, especially is it's easier to correct than to educate. It's lazy to say, what do you need help with? Why did you decide to reach out? You should ask that question, but that shouldn't be the first question. Like you should let them know you've seen a situation like theirs before. Like Reducing skepticism is is really the big thing that you're trying to do. And you do that by building reciprocity and showing up prepared and doing your research. Mm, I think I think that's such a differentiator. And and sadly it's not done, which is just, you know, it kind of begs the point. Like there's lazy salespeople out there. And I know when I get on as a consumer a call and they haven't done any homework, like it just irks me. And and I'm just like, you know what? Let's reschedule when you actually know what I do because I'm not going I went through it with Justin. Now you want yeah. me to go through it with you and then Forget it. I'm not, I'm dizzy from all the pass offs yep. that all that you've all done. And no one's actually, you know, done anything worth worthy of, of my time right now. So that annoys me. But, yep. but what you've just shared is, you know, three areas to focus on the company, the individual and the stakeholders. And I think, you know, a lot of people are like, well, how do I demonstrate value? And for me, value is right. Like just that right there showing me that this conversation has, you know, is worthy of my time because you've taken time to actually come with a point of view yeah. and it might be wrong, but it's an assumption based on, you know, my role, my title, the industry, there's trigger points. But like you said, like I can either correct you. I can say, you know what, a little bit along this line, but there might also be a little bit of an awareness there that you've brought that I wasn't fully, you know, um, aware of. And so that also leaves me feeling emission initially like my, my guards probably up and my hands are tight and all of a sudden they start loosening and I'm like okay this guy's a bit different he's coming with a point of view he's done some homework and I feel that's when they start letting you in because you're different yep yes totally I mean being different and showing up as a sales professional is just everything I mean gong's got a stat it's and they were pulling people to get cold outreach from executives that get cold outreach. And it was something like 90 plus percent of the people that 
Catapult, these these business executives said that their number one complaint was that they felt like the person sending them the outreach didn't understand them or their business or their role. Um, Rain Group did a big study on this. 58% of meetings buyers feel like are an absolute waste of time, the ones that they attend with salespeople. Uh, Gartner, 56% of B2B uh, purchases for software, like they experience buyer's regret. So in other words, 56% of the time when an executive team purchases software, they regret doing it. It doesn't actually do the thing that they the rep said it was supposed to. So in sales, you got to remember, your buyer starts from a place of skepticism. We get treated a lot like lawyers and politicians almost. Maybe not as bad as politicians in the United <laughs> States, at least. <laughs> um, but like we get treated with a like, think about it. Most people, when they go to the doctor, they aren't like skeptical of whether the doctor knows what they're doing. You kind of just go there and expect to like be educated, right? And in sales, you just got to remember that you're starting from a place of skepticism because that prospect has all of this baggage from all of their experiences with people like us that they bring into that moment. So you just need to do these things that help you get back to the starting line because we're starting from behind the starting line and, and building reciprocity and showing up prepared. That's a way that you get an executive to take you seriously. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take a lot of time, but you know, I, I completely agree. And most of my trainings, I start with a slide from Daniel Pink's book to, to sales human with that perception of the word cloud and what they, what people think yeah. of what word when it comes to sales and the larger the word, yeah. the more respondents. And it's like, ugh, gross yeah. use car salesman. And I always say that yeah. is the perception. Like the bar yep. is low that you just have to not be, <laughs> you know, a, a, a slimy, gr greasy used car salesperson and take some time and, and even, you know, answer the questions that they haven't even thought to ask. Like yeah. all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, because then you move from, you know, a threat to you're actually helping me. You're, you're bringing things to my attention that I have to think about. And, and that's service. That's not selling. That's in yeah. service because as a business owner, you know, that's time, that's money. Um, that's competitive advantage. That's so many benefits that I just think it's such, um, it's easy, but it's, it continues to not be done. And, and I think I, I'm also guilty of that like when I get on a call, I, I assume the worst. I'm like, this person <laughs> is, is, is not going to be prepared. I already know it. And so if they are, I'm like, oh, I'm pleasantly surprised. So I'm also jaded, which isn't good. But I think because there's yeah. still a lot of folks out there. Yeah, me too. I mean, I just hopped on, I won't mention the company, but it's a very well-known company that does software reviews, the biggest one of them, right? The site that you go to that rates all of the software providers. And I hopped on a call with our account manager. I'm like, I could tell in like a minute that this was not someone that I wanted to spend a lot of time talking with because he asked me where I live and what my business does and stuff, just like basic shit that you could, you know, like could look at. Um, so yeah, so reverse engineer success. Power in numbers, champion building, building reciprocity is a really big one. And then the other core strategy, the fourth one is, you know, building momentum and reducing uncertainty. This is the stuff that happens during the discovery conversations. Really, it's all about how do I get momentum in this deal and how do I reduce uncertainty for the buyer? You do that in a couple of ways. Um, so I think like, how you start the call with that hypothesis and that point of view is very powerful. And then your ability to put bumper guards up on the conversation and like really focus in and go deep on something that the buyer cares about is really critical. So the thing that I see a lot of reps struggle with when I listen and coach around these calls is the conversation ends up being 30 to 45 minutes long and it goes in too many different directions. And the way that the conversation works from a question standpoint for the rep is if you it's sort of garbage in garbage out. So if you're getting bad answers from the prospect and they're not focused on the areas that you can help them with, that's just really the result 99 times out of 100 that you're asking really poor questions. So one way that you can really set up the call well, I call it an alignment statement. You basically say, I talk to people like you, and they typically come to us for one of these two reasons. Which bucket do you fall into? And that sounds something like, um, hey, Karen, you know, we work with a lot of contact center leaders from companies like X, Y, and Z. And I'm really curious for you how this might resonate, if at all. Usually, they're focused on one of two things. One is reducing cost to serve. So customers are not self-serving enough through FAQ pages and chat. And they just keep calling in. It's driving up the cost to serve. 
The other aspect is more agent focus. So with our agents, how do we provide better training, coaching, et cetera, to improve first call resolution, keep customers from coming back, maintain high MPS scores, that sort of stuff. Again, how, if at all, does that resonate with you and kind of what's top of mind for you right now? And usually if I've reverse engineered success well, and I know the reasons people come to me, I've nailed that part of it. They should almost cut you off in the middle of that statement being like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the FAQ page, I've been working with our digital team on that. Like they keep calling in. Okay, cool. Now I'm in a discovery conversation that like I skipped all of this like BS and I got straight to something that really matters to them. So that alignment statement I find is a really great way to start. You got to really work on that language. And part of reverse engineering success, like I said, I reverse engineered 42 of my last closed one deals. And I found there's like two reasons why people come to me. You know, it's like they're going outbound for the first time as an organization. So it's never been a focus for them, really, that people have done it, but it's never been an org wide focus. Or it's like we're expanding in some sort of way. We have a new product that we're expanding. We're expanding into a new like geographic location. Uh, we're expanding up market and moving into enterprise. Like there's like those are the situations, really. Those those are the two. So that's what I ask at the very beginning of the call. And again, what I'm doing is I'm reducing uncertainty. I'm showing the buyer that I have seen your situation before and we've helped other people exactly like you. You got to think about how you're reducing uncertainty through your discovery, too, by just demonstrating that you've worked with people like them. So I'll go ahead and pause there. That's a really big piece. And I think, you know, back to human behavior, it allows them to feel heard as well. Like this guy yeah. has been there. And I think that validation yep. um, allows people to loosen their grip. But but mm -hmm. I think I think if, if people are listening and they're thinking, well, how do I determine what those two points are for me? Like like back to what you said, go back and look at, you know, where are you closing business and what yep. problems are you are you solving? I, I think you give them one, two or three. And just even if, you know. There's going to align to, or there's going to be a close alignment with one of them until you really get granular. And it's that iterations that every call you go into based on who you're talking to, you get more clear on what those are. So like what you said, when you, you know, you're two, that they don't even need you to finish talking to like that one right there. And, and that allows yep. them to feel hurt. I feel like it builds trust and it also compresses the sales cycle because you've missed all that stuff. And you're like, okay, now that there's that, that problem acknowledgement from both sides, like, hey, let's, let's go, like, let's keep going. Like, that in itself drives organic organic momentum. Exactly. Yeah, it, it also gives you. I don't know, I hate to keep dropping stats, but it's like somewhere around 75 percent of buyers, according to Gartner, prefer a rep free buying experience. It's like that should come as no surprise, right? I mean, people would rather spend as much like as little time as possible with a buyer. So just understand that you you get less FaceTime nowadays than you did before. So you got to maximize every like minute that you get to speak with a prospect. You have to maximize, especially if you get an exec on the call, that might be the only time that you get to chat with them is that 20 to 30 minutes. So your ability to cut through the fluff and get straight to the heart of the matter is so powerful. Um, so the next part of this, this building momentum and reducing uncertainty is, well, just really the big middle chunk of every discovery convert or I guess intro call and discovery is something I believe is woven through the entire sales process. It's not, it's not a call. It's, it's, a, it's an act, right? You're doing it constantly, but that's the, like, if we speak through the context of that first conversation, generally, um, I call it the discovery loop. So the discovery loop is essentially this loop that I want to go through of priority and goal, uh, problem, and then path. So priority and goal, problem, and then path. So if we take that contact center example again with reducing cost to serve, what I'm going to start asking is if I've hit on something that's important to them, I'm going to start wanting to understand, is there some sort of executive or business priority that's attached to this? And the reason why that's so powerful is Again, I'm going to keep dropping stats because <laughs> I think this, the, the data just does not lie with this. Another Gartner stat, you know, 93% of B2B buyers when polled said that their purchase aligned with an executive level priority. So in other words, the thing that they bought was aligned with a business priority. And oftentimes what sellers forget to do is 
it's not about pulling you into our world and talking about our stuff. It's about finding out what you already care about and talking about how this aligns with that. Those are two very different ways of selling. You can get to the same path, but the buyer is going to care a lot more if it's connected to in a priority. So the priority and goal is really what I'm trying to figure out is what do you already care about? And then how is that being measured? Like, what is the actual outcome that you're looking to drive? So you're going to run into a couple of snags here. One, you might be talking to someone that doesn't know what those are. So if I'm talking to a sales enablement manager, they don't, they don't know what the CRO's priorities are usually. So I can ask, hey, in your guys' last all hands call with your, with your sales leaders, you know, your CRO, Katie, what did she talk about that's like an org wide priority that this is, you know, sort of connected to or could help with or related to? You might get some good intel there. Um, if they don't know, this is a really good reason to multi-thread and loop other people in. So you could say, hey, not a problem. In, in the next call, we'll make sure to loop in you know, so-and-so or so-and-so. We can get a little bit more intel. And the reason I asked that, Karen, is that what I find is that if, you know, if what we're talking about is not aligned with a, a business priority, sometimes it's hard to get stuff done. So I want to make sure that we're, that we're aligned there. Um, the metrics piece. So the measurement, the goal. Uh, I'm curious, so like, let's make it very real. So if reducing cost to serve is a priority and they're trying to reduce the cost to serve by a couple hundred dollars per customer, like I'm going to ask them, how, how do you guys measure that? Another question I'd like to ask is, hey, if we were to zoom ahead, you know, 12 months from now, how would you guys know if this project was a success or failure? So I want to understand like what the priority is how they're measuring it and like what the actual outcome is that they're looking to drive. And what I would really push you to do is speak to like very objective measurements. Like you need a KPI, a metric, something that they are using to measure it. Otherwise, if there's no KPI or metric, it's not important enough to the people running the company if there's not a, a metric attached to it. Mm hmm. So much gold there, Jason. And just the way you were asking that question where you had Katie, you had her name, you had the CRO, you provided context, you were presumptuous and let's bring them on to the next. Let's make sure to bring them on to the next meeting. Like the, the confidence in the way you ask that versus, you know, someone less experienced might be a little bit more fragmented and say, like, would it be OK if mm -hmm. we and then they're going to say no. Right. But the fact that you wove that in there seamlessly and also provided them some context. And the reason why is that when we see they're excluded, it stalls the deal and it holds it up. But again, if you know their priority yep. and their outcome, and this is going to prevent them from achieving that, they want to bring that next person in. So it's just beautifully orchestrated the way you deliver that. Yeah. So it's priority and outcome. The next piece is problems. So the problem really I mean, the problem really is like, where are you at right now? And then where are you trying to go? And the problems are like the reasons for that. So the next kind of like general way that you can steer the conversation is, well, how are things going right now, Karen? So you said that you want to reduce costs to serve by 200 bucks. It's a big initiative. We know it's important to Katie and the, and, and the entire executive team. How, how has it been going? What progress have you guys made on that? And I'm just trying to get like objectively where they're trying to go and where they're at. And again, people might not have these like goals and like measurables specifically ready for you on that call. You just speak in generalities, like just broadly speaking, how have you guys done with that? Are you halfway towards it a quarter of the way? Like what, what kind of problems are you running into? And this is where I can have some really good, like you should know what the problems are. Like if we use that cost to serve example, the number one problem is, hey, we don't have a way to collect data from our customers outside of them just submitting a survey. So the way that I would kind of ask that question, I call this framework question stacking. It's instead of asking what's your biggest problem, it's sharing a problem that you hear from people like them and then asking them how it resonates. So I might say something like, Karen, not sure if you're running into this, but when we're working with Nordstrom, one of the things they kept running into was people would try to self-serve. They would call into the contact center and they didn't really understand why that was happening because statistically out of all the emails that they sent out to get surveys from people, only 3% of them fill it out. So they weren't capturing the information from call recordings, emails, instant messages, and 
combining all of that data and getting actionable insights on how to reduce friction in the buying process. So I'm really curious, how do you guys capture data outside of the surveys right now? Like, how do you, how do you get that data and, and what do you think that data could provide for you? So I'm able to kind of have the conversations around, again, key priorities and outcomes that they want. I'm having conversations around typical priorities, and I'm really trying to get an idea of what the current state is. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you safely exposed a gap there. Like, I, I, And I say safely because you leveraged Nordstrom, and you kind of made it okay that there, you're not the only one, you know, if this is you, there's no shame mm -hmm. in it because there's a lot of other people doing that. So you created that safe space for them to yep. almost put their hand up and go, yeah, because like, they're embarrassed a little bit. Like, we don't have KPIs. There is a gap. But like when you can do yeah. that in a way that's not like making, creating a hierarchy and making them feel bad about it. Um, I think that's when they kind of turn inward and be like, yeah, you know, we do have this challenge. Like you've seen it before. Can you kind of help? The next natural thing is, can you help us get out of this place? Yeah. It's, uh, you made such a good point there on how to phrase questions. And this is the, this is the art part I feel like of selling where I was just on a group coaching call. Uh, earlier, right before this, actually, with probably like a dozen or so sales reps on there. And and I was talking about this concept of a negative reversal that I was taught. And it's it's asking the question in a way that does not make an assumption that they're having a problem with it, nor that they would they care about solving it. And it's it's saying things like, Karen, I just you know want to be frank with you. I mean, I noticed you've been in this role for about a decade at this company. You guys have probably already figured out this cost to serve kind of challenge and the people calling in. But I but I want to ask because a lot of customers like X, Y, and Z are running into this issue where they put all of this work in designing this awesome digital experience and getting people to use FAQs and chatbots and then they just keep calling in. Does that all like resonate with you? Is that something you're seeing right now? Or do you got this totally figured out? I'm giving them a way to like tell me that they have it figured out. And I'm also giving them an opportunity to correct me. So that's a really great technique if you can really go in and just not assume that they have the problem. If you're going to make an assumption, assume they've already figured out the problem, but you're going to double check. That's that's the assumption that you would make. And and how do you how do you suggest folks practice with that? Like can, you know, I know, I know they can, you know, join your your out, outbound squad, but for those who uh perhaps are looking to do this internally, just practice because I find a lot of times they're winging it. And it's like, I always say like, what's the outcome? What mm -hmm. information do you need? And then reverse engineer, what questions do I have to ask to get that? And then, you know, look at the tonality, look at how you're asking them, or is your guard going to go up for that? So how do you soften it? So do you have any suggestions as to ways people can practice asking those right questions that leverage a lot of the techniques that you just shared with us to ensure that they are getting the, the result response and the information that they need? Yeah. I think one of the first things that's really important with practice is this concept of chunking. And it's the same thing you would do in sports, right? With basketball, like basketball practice is not just you play a full game every practice. Like you practice like small parts of like shooting, shooting free throws, dribbling, defense, rebounding, et cetera. So just breaking apart the call into chunks is a really good place to start. And then you could practice either with yourself or, or with your manager or whoever. Like I would try to simulate a real situation. So if you wanted to make it really practical, look at your calls this week or last. And what were the specific situations you ran into that were really uncomfortable? And like literally have your manager or whoever you're role playing with simulate that. Say, hey, Karen, like here's a like a like four bullet points on the situation. And it would be like, I was talking to contact center director. Um the person would not open up to me about the problem that they were having with self-serve. Here's the question that I want to ask. Here's the, like create a situation versus like these like role plays that kind of don't work that well. Right. I'm going to have you actually be a prospect and give you the information on them. And then I can like practice and simulate like certain parts of the call. That's the best way to do it. And then record it, listen back to it, et cetera. But you got to put that work in. I think AI we brought up before the recording is getting there's some solutions out there where you can practice with an AI. Between us and your <laughs> podcast listeners, I think they're pretty bad. Yeah, I've I've tried them before, especially the cold calling ones. Um, so I don't think we're there yet from an AI standpoint, but just good old fashioned find a partner. 
But the hack there is give them a real situation and then practice. Mm -hmm. And and I, I agree chunking it out and isolating it, but also it's the reps. It's just getting through with them. Cause I had a coaching call earlier this week and it was just, we were going through things and by the fourth time he was getting it. And then it was like, okay. And, but then, yeah. but then I said, how do you feel? And he's like, good. That felt good. Cause I knew he was trying to get yeah. that, but I didn't back down every time it was like, we're isolating this one. And it was like from the top, from the top. And, and then it was like, then you make it your own. But I, yeah. I feel like if you just kind of phone it in, you're not going to, you're not going to like anything. You're not going to get that muscle memory. But also, I think there's an element of self-reflection and kind of saying, like, uh, what what part do I, did I actually do the work here? Did I look at, you know, the industry, the company, the other stakeholders, things like that? Because sometimes we're, oh, they're not going to buy. And, you know, we're making excuses up. And I think there's also an element of we have to take accountability that I didn't do the work. Got to put in the work. The practice is the most underrated piece. And if you're listening to this and you're a leader, this should be like, you should be facilitating this practice. This is stuff that your managers should be doing. There should, this should be a, incorporated into team calls. Like one of the hacks, um, I call them get shit done sessions, GSDs, is uh, like take an existing meeting that you have right now. People typically do a one hour team meeting per week. Spend the first 10 minutes doing this type of practice. Put people in the breakout rooms. Hey, here's the situation. We're going to work on cold call openers. All you're going to do with your partner for that 10 minutes, and I'm going to bounce around between the breakout rooms and listen, is you're just going to over and over and over and over again practice those openers. You have to assume as a sales leader uh, that your reps aren't practicing on their own because most of them aren't. Like it, it has to be part of the job, something they're getting paid to do. Mm -hmm. But as a sales leader, that's your job, and that's why you're getting paid to do it to drive performance of your team. So I get really frustrated when I hear exactly. that, you know, and I think that's a great idea. So if you're listening to this, the first 10 minutes, what can you do to practice your opener? Uh, just practicing open-ended questions, practicing after they share something, getting to impact. How can you get below the surface? And just 10 minutes, I think, on those isolated yep. um, events and uh, parts of the, of the sales process is going to, in that moment, you're going to revert back to what those questions were. But I think even more important, what did you say that got you? Like, you got it. It's like, I'm going to remember that because that's exactly like I got that nugget, which allowed me to advance. I created momentum and, you know, I brought in the, the right people. Chances are you're not going to forget that because that was very powerful. Yep, exactly. Well, listen, you've kind of opened our eyes to a lot of um, high level techniques that and the great thing that they can use immediately. But you, you also embody it yourself, Jason. So the way in which you carried yourself and answered your question is just uh, is remarkable. So thank you for bringing your expertise yeah. and, and walking the talk. Uh, for those who would love to learn more about you and everything you're doing over at Outbound Squad, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Yeah, OutboundSquad.com is the best place. Um, really, we're on a mission to do for reps. I feel like sales is one of the coolest careers because you can actually create real financial independence. It's one of the few occupations you can get into outside of running a business where you can make good enough money to like retire early. And I'm really on a mission to help reps create that financial independence. So uh, we have coaching programs for both AEs and, and BDRs. So everything from outbound to selling. Um, we have uh, group programs for for companies. And there's a lot of free content there as well at outboundsquad.com. We got a podcast. I post on LinkedIn every day. Um, so go check it out. Yeah, we'd love to have you. If, if you're selling professional services or software and you're trying to get your foot in the door and then trying to advance deals to close, it's uh, we can help you out. Amazing. And yes, I, I uh, definitely encourage you to do that because it is a tough world out there and Jason can definitely share some insights mm -hmm. that will help you get in the door. So thank you again today, Jason, for your time and expertise. And thanks for tuning in, folks. And we'll see you next time.